context and we lean into the stories uh, with the individuals and the characters that we recognize, we always see ourselves as the ones that are being saved instead of the ones that uh, need, uh, that instead of the ones that are doing the work in which they need to be saved from, instead of being the bad guys, if you want to call it that. We always see ourselves as the good children of God that need to be released, but we never see ourselves as the antagonists, the evil ones that keep people in bondage. And so again, I'm asking, we need, I'm saying and I'm asking, why don't we look deeper into the mirror? And I want to bring out something, um, and this goes a little bit into the contemporary space. We have elected officials that in many ways have ignored the science of wise counsel, much as Pharaoh ignored the word from God. And these individuals, they have made decisions to say things like, we'll make masks mandatory. We, won't, we don't want people to feel restricted and have their liberties infringed upon by wearing a mask. When we have all learned that distancing, wearing a mask and washing your hands are ways to stop the spread of this, this, this deadly virus. However, we have those in positions of authority that say the kids can go to school. They can sit on the same seat on the bus. We're not mandating that they wear masks. And if you decide, and, and we're not giving the option of having kids allow, or not allow, of allowing kids to learn from home. Now, I want to talk about how that, that is the public policy of right now. But when Pharaoh ignored the word of God from, from the, the deliverance, from, the, from Moses' delivery, he then said, and this is in Exodus chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, they will now make bricks without straw. And I bring this comparison because now it's like, how are you asking us to do this task of creating bricks without a primary ingredient? We can't rest, we have to go out and find it and gather our own straw. So again, we have to talk about how laws get made from the minds in, of men after they have ignored wise counsel from those who know more than they do. This is how we draw these comparisons. Again, we are acting, let me, let me pull that back. Our leaders, those in authority, are behaving in a way that is very similar to that of Egypt. And we need to make that clear distinction there. I don't want to say any more than that. I don't want to get into where they go to church or who they pray to. That is not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about when we compare those who are uh, being oppressed by something and those who are passing laws that do not line up with the wise counsel that we have heard, this is what it looks like. Moses came to Pharaoh multiple times with wise counsel. God has heard the cries of his children in Israel. You should let them go. Pharaoh would say no. God would send a plague. Moses would go again, makes the, make the same uh, ask, the same request. Pharaoh would say, no, God will send a plague. So what we need to understand is this is what this looks like right now. On, I would say on this side of heaven, I often say that. We are called to do two things, two of the greatest commandments. All right? Two of the greatest commandments. And that comes in, um, excuse me. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Can you pull it up real quick? When asked, Jesus was asked and he said, Teacher, uh, we have these Ten Commandments. And so uh, Matthew 30, yeah, I think it's 22, uh, 36 through 40. 
So look here, yes, Jesus was doing his teaching. And of course, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. And they asked teacher in verse 36, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You know the next one. And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Next one. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love God. Keep going. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What is it that we are doing now shows that we love people? If we are enforcing rules from those in authority that tell us, yes, kids can sit together, you can come to work, we know uh, we're going to downplay, I'll say, this, uh, this, this, this sickness that is going through the land. What about that is loving people? So we have to think about that. We have to dwell on that. And because we know that it does not show a love for people, it shows just a disregard for godly common sense, we have to react accordingly. So we have to wear our masks, we have to distance, we have to wash our hands, because we cannot depend on those in authority to make those rules just comprehensively across the land. Again, because of the avoidance and the ignoring of wise counsel. Now, the reason that I'm, I'm going here, because this is something that kind of hit me kind of hard. Uh, we've lived through this pandemic since last year, since March of uh, 2020. And uh, it had all of us anxious. You know, in the, at the beginning of it, we shut down. We stayed away. We, 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 we didn't go to the places that we typically go to. And a little time after that, when they were promising results from the vaccine, those that took it, they did. Others scheduled the time to take it. And we saw this as like, okay, things are starting to open back up. But now we have this, we have these new variants. And these variants have been afflicting children in a way that we have not seen. And so this is near and dear to me because what I think about is, yes, I have two older sons that qualify for the vaccine and they've had it, but I have a six-year-old that is not eligible for it. And we, again, we have seen this virus afflict children in ways that we have not seen before. Have a colleague that, is, that keeps me kind of up to date on these things that I work with. And he says that, you know, they've seen numbers increase at Le Bonner's Children's Hospital because of this, 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 uh, this virus. And it's directly attributed to uh, a willful ignoring of wise counsel through God-given talent. We have people who are blessed in science in ways that I can't even fathom or imagine. They're way smarter than I am. They have done the test. It is their job to do these tests and to do these trials and to do these experiments. And when they get the results from these exper experiments, they tell us this is the, the path that we need to take. And again, Wise counsel does not always, and I know this is one thing we need to understand, wise counsel does not always come from a person in a pulpit wearing a robe. God speaks to us through many different ways. And we know what we're dealing with. We're avoiding this wise counsel, and that is not of God. That is not of uh, a common sense, God-given way of thinking. I want to pivot for a minute and ask this question. It's, I, we can take it as a rhetorical question, but if someone wants to talk through it, we can. So how can we claim the struggle and the deliverance of Israel when we act like Egypt? 
again. How can we claim the struggle and the deliverance of Israel when we behave like Egypt? Those two things are incongruent. They don't match. They don't go together. We can't claim to be saved in a God-given way when we act in a way that is not of God. Now, God has mercy and can save whomever he wants to save, but we can't pretend as if we are the good guy in every last single situation and apply it to our lives when we act very much like the bad guy in a lot of the things that we do. Now, I want to, uh, again, I want to pivot here for a moment and kind of go here. A second question, well, second, uh, this pivot speaks to being um, inhospitable. Being inhospitable. If you could uh, go to Genesis 1, excuse me, excuse me, Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15. It's the story of Abraham. So yeah, Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15. And we're gonna, we'll read these, and it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you, now that you have come to your servant, very well they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three salves from the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah, they asked. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Sarah and, excuse me, Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Next year, I, <clears throat> excuse me, Next year, I will return to you at the appointed time, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. Now, I brought this, this series of scriptures out because it speaks to the hospitality of the man that God said, I will make you the father of many nations. Abraham was in tune, his eyes were open, he understood that the three men that he saw were angels of the Lord. He understood that I'm in their presence, I'm going to bow. And not only will I bow, I will prepare the best for them. And even though Abraham recognized who they were, they were strangers in that land. But Abraham showed the utmost hospitality to them. And I'm going somewhere with this. We 
are not showing hospitality to those who are the most vulnerable. And as it relates to this, this pandemic, we've seen that the most vulnerable are the elderly and children. Elderly, uh, as we've seen with COVID, a little bit more susceptible, susceptible to it. And children, of course, under the, age, you know, under the age of 12 cannot be vaccinated. Yet we are not showing any sort of hospitality to these populations. Again, we refuse to, or those in authority that govern us uh, oftentimes are not listening to the science. They're not listening to this wise counsel. And in addition to ignoring their wise counsel, they practice purposeful inhospitality. Again, purposeful inhospitality, creating inconvenience for those who are the most vulnerable. Purposeful inhospitality. I want us to remember that phrasing, purposeful inhospitality. And in practicing purposeful inhospitality, I want us to go to, there'll be a couple of verses I want to go to, uh, Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50, Ezekiel 15, verses 49 and 50. And this particular verse brings up a lot of conversation and a lot of debate in the church. Yeah, oh, so Ezekiel, um, excuse me. Yeah, Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. Now, we all know the fate of the city Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know, again, it was God talking to Abraham, and Abraham being the, 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 the key figure that he, that he is, that he was, was actually able to negotiate with God. God said, hey, I'm going to, Sodom and Gomorrah has, has displeased me in their ways. I'm going to destroy the city because there's nothing good there. And Abraham practically negotiated. He said, Father, what if there are 40 good people? And God said, if there are 40 good people, I would not destroy it. And Abraham kept negotiating down. He said, what if there are 30 good people? God said, well, you know, if there are 30, I won't destroy it. What if there are 20? There's 20, I won't destroy it. What if there's 10? There's 10, I won't destroy it. But the people of Sodom, collectively, wholesale, were so purposely inhospitable there were less than 10 people in the entire city that, uh, that would warrant God saving the city. The final, I think the, uh, the, the final negotiation was God told, uh, he said, Abraham, tell your nephew Lot and his family to leave because that is it. Everyone else in the city is inhospitable. And that's where we get to this verse here. He said, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant overfed and unconcerned they did not help the poor and needy verse, verse 50 they were haughty and did detestable things before me therefore I did away with them as you have seen now just want to put it out there yes there was sexual immor immorality in Sodom and Gomorrah but as a Bible-based church, we will not rest on sexual immorality being the only thing that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed for. Just as it said in verse 49, they were overfed and unconcerned, the poor and the needy. Remember that, overfed and unconcerned with the poor and needy. If we were to put that in a contemporary context, it would probably read as to say this was a well, a wealthy place, a rich place that did not care about those that had less than, those that um, were denied opportunity. Again, overfed and unconcerned with the poor and the needy. Purposefully inhospitable. And we can even debate and say that the, 
the detestable and haughty things that they did were also inhospitable. You know, we don't have to go all the way into that, but we will say that sexual immorality was not the only thing that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed for. Even in the way that that verse there is crafted, the first thing that is listed is being overfed and unconcerned with the poor and needy, and then they talked about the, the uh, detestable and the haughty things. So if it looks like from a matter of order and priority, one thing came before the other as being the thing that God did not like more than the other. But if we, even if we don't want to go there again, we can understand that it was not just sexual immorality for which that city was destroyed for. They were purposely inhospitable. Um, real quick, go to Jeremiah 23, verse 14. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Again, we're looking here, seeing something horrible, commit adultery, live a lie, strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. Again, sexual immorality is not the lone thing that destroyed those cities, that God destroyed those cities for. They were, uh, again, they strengthened the hands of evildoers. They were overfed and unconcerned with the poor and the needy. And watching what has happened with us as a community, as a city, as a country, as a, as a state, we cannot carry on being overfed and unconcerned with the poor and needy. We cannot allow public policy to push our unconcern for the poor and the needy. We cannot allow ourselves to be purposefully inhospitable. In doing those things, we take on the characteristics of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they were purposefully inhospitable, along with the sexual immorality that existed. But they were purposely inhospitable. The Bible says so. So as we manage, live, survive, thrive through this pandemic. We cannot let our baser instincts tell us that it is okay to ignore those who need help. We cannot let our lesser instincts inform us above the wise counsel of smart, godly, or smart science that is God-given talent. We cannot allow purposeful inhospitality to define us. Should we go that route, we are no better than Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know the example there. We know the example there. And so there's another rhetorical question that I want to ask. Again, because we often look at ourselves, when we're looking in the mirror, we see ourselves as a good guy. So this rhetorical question I want to ask is, um, how can we seek the blessings of Abraham, yet we have the inhospitable ways of Sodom? How can we seek the blessings of Abraham, yet we have the inhospitable ways of Sodom? Again, and this, I think this is a math term, I'm not sure. Those two things are incongruent. God knew that Sodom was not a good place. 
and those connected to Abraham, he said, you need to get them out because I'm about to destroy this city. So that lets us know that there was no room in a wicked place for good people, for obedient people. So again, the question, how can we seek the blessings of Abraham when we have the inhospitable ways of Sodom? It is impossible. So when we are purposely inhospitable, we cannot carry on as if we are champions of the Lord. Going back to an earlier point, what do champions of the Lord, what do we do? We make note of the two greatest commandments. As Jesus said, these are the two greatest commandments of the law. Love God, love people. Those two things are congruent. You can do both of those. You can love God and you can love people. They, those two things match. They go together. Jesus says so. And he commands so. But again, we cannot, uh, the blessings of Abraham do not match and are not congruent with the inhospitable ways of Sodom. The, excuse me, the, uh, the deliverance and the, the deliverance and the, and the saving of Israel does not match with the behavior of Egypt. Now, other things to consider, and this is just, if I, was, if I were in a, a, a workshop or a session, it was just, this, would just be, this would be called housekeeping. As we go into the world, as we are ambassadors of Christ, as we are ambassadors <clears throat> of this faith, we know what we believe and we know how to live in this world. We know that we should seek wise counsel. So, you no, know, and also in accordance with the, with the centers for, uh, for, the, for the CDC, Wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a mask. And the Pfizer vaccine has been FDA approved, which I believe was a hesitancy for uh, quite a few people. Get vaccinated as soon as you can. Now, while those things are not commandments, those are examples of how you can love God and love people. One thing that Pastor Vince always touches on is that we are not a, uh, um, I would say a traditional church. We don't just show up on Sunday, shout the house down, and send everybody home to a chicken dinner. We're doing things differently. We have the 529 college plan. We have the, the BGI um, home plan, setting up down payment assistance and uh, college fund assistance for families. Um, and that is one way through building wealth that Pastor Vince believes that we can honor God and love people at the same time. He wants us, of course, to be lenders and not borrowers. In the same vein, that means that we are a church of sound information. So when the experts are telling us that we should do these things to prevent the spread, we should listen to the experts. So again, um, as we leave here tonight, I want us to look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Are you Israel? Are you Egypt? Are you Abraham? Are you Sodom? Which of these does your behavior and your life and your faith which one of these do you do they, do they represent do we listen 
to wise counsel or do we ignore it and do what we want to do? And in the process of doing what we want to do, are we being purposely inhospitable? Well, that's my lesson. Thank you for everyone that uh, is in virtual attendance uh, and is listening right now. Uh, <clears throat> I will close out with prayer. And after the prayer, I want everyone to stay safe and uh, have a good night. So uh, please bow your heads. Lord God, thank you for this, um, this opportunity to teach. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share. Lord, I pray that those that listened, those that heard, uh, those that acknowledged that this was um, a help for them, that this was a blessing for them. Lord, we know that on this side of heaven, God, that there are some ways that are, again, purposely inhospitable. But Lord, we know that through your way, through your grace, and through your mercy, we can embody the Christ ways that you want us to have. Lord, again, as we go back to our homes, as we go back to our workplaces, as we go back to those places where we come in contact with people, Lord, we ask that a spirit of healing be in the land. Lord, we ask that a spirit of overcoming is in the land. Yes, Lord, this is a difficult time, but we know that through you, difficult times can be overcome. Lord, we know that through you, anything is possible. So, Lord, as we leave this place, may we never leave your presence. May we always have access to your grace and your mercy. And Lord, may you bless those that hear, listen, receive, read, and do what your word calls us to do. It's in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.